The majority of our people, 70% are nomads, and they want to stay in their old way of life. And for them, water has always meant life or death. Every herdsman sees himself as a commander, leading his prized troops into a daily war of survival. He knows every bush and every water hole in this battlefield, and that just an extra 50 camels can easily turn it into a wasteland. That is why the casualties of the other war, the refugees, are threatening to tip the balance of survival against our nomads. They are draining the land of water, of grazing, and of scrub. A refugee camp of over 50,000, like Sabaad, must find and burn off great areas of scrub if they are to survive. These girls left the camp at dawn and scavenged over 40 kilometers for these bundles to feed their campfires so they can cook their free food. We are not thinking to resettle them forever in Somalia. First of all, economically, it's not feasible. Somalia is struggling to feed its own citizens. And there is no much room in Somalia to absorb that people of that magnitude. Therefore, politically, we cannot afford to absorb them and result them in Somalia. Politically, it's not our intention to do so, because we hope, as I said earlier, that these people will go back to their homeland one day. <laughs> Until the conflict in the Horn is settled, these refugees have nowhere else to go. They are confined to camps and a miserable existence. We in Somalia are also still counting the cost of the conflict. After the Soviets have left, we still have to keep the army and we still have to maintain it, but we have to maintain this from our own internal resources, which is really, and the costs are crashing. This must be one of the longest runaways in Africa. It was built by the Russians and now may be used as a landing base by the American Rapid Deployment Force. As part of their aid package, the Americans are proposing improving these facilities. But so far, there is very little evidence of their presence or of their aid. We have no intention of establishing an American base there. We're going to use the facilities, improve them, and then use them. So initially, in the very near, for the immediate future, there will be no American military there at all, except on a case-by-case -case basis when a ship comes in, for example or a plane might use the airstrip. Uh, the long-range projection is for possibly a small caretaker uh, group to maintain the facility uh, during the times when they, uh, it is not being used. So it is not envisioned that there will be a large American military presence in Berbera for the uh, foreseeable future. I see, Mr. Ambassador, many Somalis believe that you are deliberately stalling that because we had expelled one superpower before, you do not really trust us. Are you stalling in giving us aid? No. No. We, uh, the process takes time. You have to determine what you're going to provide, what the Somali government needs, what it wants, and what we can within the limits of the resources available. 
given to us by the Congress, uh, what we can provide. And uh, so this takes time. It also takes time to procure the various items. There is no, no desire whatever to stall. In fact, our government, my government, is looking into what it can do at this moment to accelerate delivery of military assistance to Somalia. Do you consider the Somali position realistic in turning to the United States and the West for military aid after many years of a very close relationship to the Soviet Union? Well, I think they might have got a better response if they had um, kept better relations with the West while still having this very close relationship with the Soviet Union. But since they hadn't done that, they could hardly really expect the West simply to replace the Soviet Union at the same level of military supplies in a situation where the West risked becoming sucked into an extremely unpopular war and risked being accused of supporting a local power which was widely regarded, misregarded and misrepresented as being expansionist because of this persisting misunderstanding about the nature of, Somali, of the Somali independence struggle in eastern Ethiopia. Do you think there's a danger of an invasion of Somalia by Ethiopia backed up by the Soviets and the Cubans? We're talking about tomorrow, in the very near future. I, I don't see that that uh, is an imminent danger. As for the long term, what might happen, I think it's very hard to say. One can only say that the Soviet Union has military people in Ethiopia, has military people in Aden. There are Cuban forces in uh, Ethiopia. There is an antagonism against Somalia by the Ethiopians and South Yemen. The Soviet Union uh, certainly does not have good feelings about the present government of Somalia. And then you take the open enmity expressed by Gaddafi for the Siad government, and you have the ingredients of, of, of possible trouble, obviously. Now again, many Somalis and others believe that if there was an invasion, you would not back us up, would you? It would all depend on the circumstances, and uh, we have a an increasingly firm relationship with Somalia. We have a strong friendship, and this, I hope, is going to improve as time goes on. Uh, we would and could not, under the circumstances, ignore a aggression against a friend. What I think surprised the Americans was the level and intensity of the Russian response to the Ethiopian problem and the extent to which Russia has manifestly been willing to become militarily involved as the superpower protecting Ethiopia and solving its internal problems. But not, I think, solving them completely. Because it seems to me that it's not in the Russian interest that there should be complete peace and tranquility inside Ethiopia or between Ethiopia and her neighbors. For if that were the case, obviously the Russians would be redundant and the Ethiopians would simply do what they've done in the past. They would ask them to leave and get rid of that superpower because they didn't need them any longer, which would enable the Americans, who still, I think, are interested for a variety of reasons, economic as well as political, in now, perhaps, eventually returning to Ethiopia, which would enable the Americans to return. It looks to us in Somalia that we are in for a long bargaining session in the American Arms Bazaar. But they have moved quite quickly on their civilian aid package. The United States has supplied around $79 million in food programs, mainly for the refugees, and about $15 million in development projects. But we remember that during the Vietnam War, the United States cut off all aid to our country because a ship bearing the Somali flag was seen in a North Vietnamese port. Like the Russians, the American aid package comes wrapped up in political and ideological strings. Another area that we're trying to uh, provide help in is the private sector. 
The government has indicated over the past year that it would like to take some of the burden off the government agencies by expanding the private sector. And uh, because of our own emphasis on this in the United States, we, we feel that we can bring some special insights. And so we are working with the ministries of industry and commerce to try and open up the private sector here more than it has been in the past. Now, as far as the programs and projects, who decides which projects? Yes. Well, it's, it's, it's very much a uh, matter of collaboration. That is, we go to the government and suggest, uh, what are your priorities? And after the government has spelled these out, we find which of those uh, we can provide the assistance in because of our own rationale at the present time. So that we work together on what the priorities should be. Some donors are able to help in some areas better than in other areas, and other donors uh, have their own specialties. But who, who really has the final say, since you are the, fund, you are the ones who fund? Well, I, I guess that uh, the final say, since uh, we are the bankers, uh, would be with us. But I know of no instance here in Somalia where we would entertain doing anything that the government was not urging on us. So in, in that sense, it's the government that makes the decision. Although we have learned to adjust to both superpowers, we have our own way of doing things in Somalia. The government that came to power in 1969 decided to promote Somalia's development through scientific socialism, which is a pragmatic blend of Marxist and Islamic principles. It promised to radically change the lives of everyone, especially the children, who are not only encouraged to sing revolutionary songs, but were recruited into learning new skills that would help us all build a better Somalia. In Somalia, our history has always been passed down by word of mouth from poet to poet. In 1972, our government finally created a written language. Everyone was involved, and during the National Literacy and Rural Development Campaign, the schools were closed down and the students became teachers. They roamed throughout the country, especially on the lookout for rural and nomadic families. Our government's program to create a modern Somalia officially recognized the special contribution that women could and should make. The Revolutionary Family Law of 1975 gave them equal rights. of these girls in our national dance theater in Mogadishu began life in a nomad camp. Now they are eager to step out in a new way of life, and the family law will allow them to look for a partner on equal terms. But it will take more than a government decree to make a real change in the traditional ways of a nomadic marriage. Afro, Ardot, Arurta, and Kadokari, and see you, 
بيتو حوش حلك أي مارت عاي جلس وفول ليه هاي عن كقبط مركب واقف صدق بري لا قبل لا عواقو هول حوش قين يا دي مر مر إنا فكاد لو يشرت هذا عسكف ليا جورج إسكتشو جورج جديس In the past, the men always called the tune in a Somali marriage. Our new family law plans to change all that. The how the link here can be well, can be more than that. Can be the link here is better. Ma ok, I know I'm more than that. I will not be. I know I'm not going to be well. Ah, I want that. And how do you make a good set? كلها أحسن تأنيك أطول لحظة يلا يا الكوكو يلا جرجا يجاب حوا ديك فرنت هاي يجرا هذا إما وقت يقول هو نيني عقلي واحد جرتين معها هدي ويرا هيرك حوا ديك فرنت هاي يداف مرت والد كي يدك كي يقول كهري سي ما بقى مكان ركض ما يجا تاني كرا لكن شرعها ويقولها وخلاص صح أنا كبر حدا جرجا مركا ها سيدا أخر جل وسكا أذكر بحاجة جرا شرعنا هو شرعي ومضى بسيل كذا نوا وحكره وقت دم بيقاعد أنا يسا وحلو بهاي هاي شرع جو ضد كلو ما قص بكرة ضد كوين الأب بس لعده ولا بهاي إنه شرع جو جرو Now our people can work together as partners to create a modern family life. In the economic field, our new sugar refinery at Kismayo is the kind of international partnership that we are looking for. It's being funded with loans from the Arab world, brought into production by European experts and Somali workers, but with a built-in training program so that we will not only own it, but be able to run it ourselves. It might surprise you to see that Somalia is not all drought and refugees. Here, between the Juba and Shavele, the two great rivers of the Horn, we have a green and fertile land which can make our government's dream of self-sufficiency in food come true. Africa, Africa. It's now over 20 years since our dream of being an independent Somali state came true. In that time, our brothers in Djibouti celebrated their independence from France, and we were the first government to recognize them. Recently, Kenya and Somalia agreed to a new relationship when we were promised that our brothers there would be guaranteed equal rights and opportunities. But always there is Western Somaliland. Why? After all this time and all the bloodshed, are we still involved in that conflict? Somali girl, bedwa hudunti Somali runti. Hudunti Somali, maana wa hawiye. Merkele ila hado dad, merkele ila hado bakale, merkele ila hado dakan wa hudunti Somali. Lakin Somali mala hada Somali girl bedala yudar. Somali wa hayra daikliye. Siri jibuti lusi. آیا کتالیس کرد حق اولی این حالا سی ایجاد حتی مرکز هدیه دورتان ایتیوبیا اما اکلی گرند قدم سومالی شکم کرده لکی وحی کو تاجری سه کلیه مذاح بنانید ایود دگرلا ما یعنی لوگرال. We are all in fact peoples who have got common interests. We are peoples who share the same geographical area. There is no question. I mean, it's not a question as if somebody is going to totally be cut off and drift away into the Indian Ocean, and we have to live together. But the question is. How do we regulate our relationship? On what basis do we, do we live together? Definitely, it is unacceptable in this you know, end of the 20th century for any peoples to be forced to accept something which is against their interest. My hope is that we, the people of the Horn, will send tractors, not tanks, against our common enemy. One of the great victories in Somali history has been our sand dune stabilization project. It doesn't require sophisticated technology or expensive experts, just the commitment of an organized people to try and find their own solution to their own problems.
through self-help and mass participation. This is a living example of how people working together can turn the horn of conflict into a horn of peace and plenty. We, the people of the Horn, know we have the most to lose if we continue to fight a war that no one will win. And we have the most to gain if we recognize the common need to find a just solution to the problems of the Horn. For most of our history, we have been used by the superpowers of the day. They have helped us to create large and expensive armies that are bleeding our countries dry. At the same time, we all must share in the responsibility for our bloody history. We also know that we owe it to our children to take the responsibility for their future into our own hands. So I must appeal to the superpowers and the rest of the world to work with us to achieve a lasting peace. I ask this in the name of all the children in the home. <laughs>